Hey, everybody, I'm Pastor JP. We're so glad you're checking us out online. Stay tuned. A great message is on the way. your friend and say, you look good today. You look good today. Just seated. Happy Easter. I'm Pastor JP. If you're, if you're a guest, this is Jesus' church, but this is my circus. <laughs> I'm the pastor here, and it's just a great day. Resurrection Sunday, but we celebrate on the first day of the week because this is the day Jesus rose. So every Sunday is a great Sunday. Amen? We're called to be a resurrection people. And so if you have your Bibles, you can just open those up to Luke chapter 8. I'm just going to read just a few verses, three verses there to be exact, and then to John 20. And I'm excited to start a new series today on Easter everywhere. So I hope that, that you'll join me over the next few weeks. Today, I want to talk about deliverance everywhere. But over the next few weeks, I'll talk about miracles and provision and protection. And so I do hope you'll join me over the next few weeks. And so today, we look at Luke 8. The first three verses. And after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him and also some women who have been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Shusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna and many others, these women were helping to support them out of their own means. Now to John chapter 20, verse 11. Now this same Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, She bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. And at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned around towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said these things to her. Well, let's pray. Lord, we pause now at the reading of your word again, asking now that your spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave, would now help us hear, see, understand. You know, what would you have of us today that we too would have an encounter with Jesus? and enter into the thoughts, mind, and heart of every listener. 
for many in this place may have made up their minds about Jesus, but might not have made up their hearts. And for some may have made up their hearts about Jesus, but haven't made up their minds. God, we pray that before we leave this house, we've made up both. And we pray it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I could not see a thing. The room was pitch black, completely dark. And I was startled awake at the sound of my name. John Paul. That's what JP stands for. John Paul. John Paul. My father was in the room. John Paul. You know, he was saying it with that hushed shout. You know, that muffled yell. Because my baby sister, who was not that old yet, was also sleeping in the same room. And so his muffled yell became more intense. John Paul. And I can't see a thing. I can't see a thing. And now I am just plain scared and becoming more paranoid. And so I, I jump up eventually because I cannot see where he is, but I do know where the light switch is. And so I turn the light on, which is exactly the opposite thing he wanted me to do. Hence the muffled yelling. He didn't want to wake up the baby sister. So I turn the light on, which is not what he wanted me to do in that moment. My dad is across the room. He is across the messy room. And he is leaning up kind of against the wall right next to what is the bathroom door. It is a two-bedroom house with one bathroom. And for some reason, our room is attached to the bathroom. And apparently, he is trying to get through our bedroom to get to the bathroom. And he is leaning up against the wall, and he has got one foot up like this in that like karate kid kind of pose like this. So he's standing there with one foot up. Apparently, he's trying to cut through in the dark. He has stepped on something. And so now, uh, in my little pre-K JP self, uh, he's looking at me and his eyes, you know, I could tell his eyes say, hurt. <laughs> and so obvious, obviously, I don't understand the assignment because he says, go get your mother. And I go look at the foot. So I go and I go, I mean, I've been woken up in the wee hours of the morning. I go over there and I get down like I'm some used car mechanic getting under the undercarriage of some pickup, and I'm looking at his foot. And so I say, yep, and I give him my diagnosis because he doesn't know what he has done. And so I tell him what he's done. You have a broken plastic tape dispenser jabbed up into your foot. And there is blood. And he says, go get your mom. And to which I, again, don't understand the assignment, and I yank the bloody tape dispenser right out of his foot. To which he gives one of those, you know, muffled. Now, I don't know how long my dad stood there in the dark with a bloody broken tape dispenser jabbed up into his foot, and I mean, it was in there. 
I also learned about tetanus shots that day. I don't know how many times he had to call my name in the dark, unbeknownst to me. I do know that at some point I eventually woke up and and I do know I heard my dad's voice because to this day, I still have this memory. I was very young. My sister was still about, couldn't have been three, maybe four years old, and I can still hear my dad's voice. I still have this memory, but I have this memory because of the emotions attached to it, of this inner struggle that I was having because I woke up and he is still calling my name and I have this wrestling match going on on the inside because I'm trying to figure out, is this real? I hear my name being called in the dark. So I have this wrestling match happening in the dark. I can't see. So do I trust it? I can hear it, but how do I know? How can I know? It's amazing, isn't it? It is amazing what you'll try to talk yourself out of when you're lying in the dark. Is, is, is that really somebody calling my name? Now, imagine standing in a room full of people who have seen you at your worst, seen you lying in the dark, seeing you at, at, at the lowest point of your life, the most vulnerable time of your existence. They were there. They've seen you raw. And they just happened to be there when Jesus called you out of that. They witness the most embarrassing time of your life, the most tormented state you have ever been in. They were there for it. They were there for every step of the transformation that your life took. They were there for that. Might have been some of the very hands that that were part of the process, could have even laid hands and prayed for you in that process, cast out demons even. Part of that moment when Jesus called your name. And now you have entered the room some years later to find this same group of people huddled, locked away, sitting in the dark. And you walk in, and you finally, like I did that day, work up enough nerve to go and flip on the light and say the truth. You got something in your foot. (laughs) Mary walks into that room and has to go tell all those guys Listen, I've seen Jesus. He's alive. Now she has to convince them that she has just received, like, the honor, the privilege, the the unmerited favor, like, all time. I've seen Jesus. Oh, and by the way, he, he he told me to tell you some things and not the other way around. Can you imagine the look on those boys' faces? Not not at the news itself, 
because only two of the guys in the room would actually even leave the bunker to go see for themselves that no one was even in the tomb. Only two. They all didn't leave, just two, just to go see if there was no body in the grave. So I would imagine that her testimony was met with confusion, doubtfulness, maybe even conceit. I would imagine they looked at each other and said, isn't this that crazy woman? You know, that crazy witch, uh, rich lady down in uh, Magdala. You know, Mary the Magdalene. Didn't Jesus cast some demons out of her? First she was talking to demons. Now she's saying she was talking to angels. There are always going to be people who are going to have a problem with your sins long after Jesus has forgiven them. They might even be sitting on your row. Maybe you are sitting here today, and part of the reasons why you, you can't raise a hand and you can't surrender your life. You can't walk the aisle. You can't bend the knee. It isn't because your heart isn't telling you to. It's because you fear the judgment of those who have seen you on your worst day. And for those of us left sitting on the road, I wonder if we ever say or do things to make others feel that way. Because maybe there is some thinking, God can't use me, God, God can't save me, or God can't trust me because no one will believe that God's working on me. Because... While we all know God can do anything he wants, these folks who have seen me at my worst, they won't believe it. And it's been that way since the beginning. But that didn't stop Mary from telling the truth. Friend, from the first mention in the Bible, Mary is riddled with demons, and now she is an apostle to the apostles. She, by the way, she, where are my ladies at? She is the first preacher to ever preach an Easter Sunday message. She is. And her great commission came by personal ceremony by the commissioner her himself, Jesus, at the very site of the resurrection. She got a good deal. Now, how does she get? How does she get here? How does she get there? She was swallowed up in darkness. She had those seven demons, the Bible says. It's not, it's not meant to be like she had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I mean, maybe she literally had seven demons. But more importantly, what it's communicating is seven all over the Bible is symbolic for completeness or, or full. In other words, she was just full up, given over, just completely, just full of darkness. They had her, the enemy, demons, just completely have taken her. And, and the enemy wants nothing but to steal and to kill and destroy. And he had full grip on her, complete grip, until Jesus called her name. 
until Jesus touched her, until Jesus found her, until Jesus sought her out, until Jesus healed her and picked her up, until Jesus brought meaning into her life, until Jesus forgave her of her sins, until Jesus brought life. Jesus said it best. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus doesn't just resurrect. Jesus is resurrection. It's who he is, not just what he does. And some people just have a hard time with this because they want a Jesus that just resurrects from time to time. You ever, you ever seen one of those defibrillators work? You know, those little things where they're, they're like, got the paddles, mm, and then they wouldn't let me play with one. And then they thought for sure I'd electrocute myself. And, and they say, clear, and they stick it on you, and they go, poof, and the body goes, douche, and it sends a electric wave, and, and then you come back, right? Hopefully. All right, well, they, everybody wants a Jesus that just, you know, when I get really bad off, I just keep coming back and go, douche. And boom, boof, bam, you come back. But who wants to do that more than once? What trauma that must do to the body to keep having to go clear, bam, clear, bam, clear, bam. I mean, who wants to do that over and over and over and over and over again? When one will do you, just like let them just stay in the room with them. Let them be who he is, he wants a relationship, a connection. That's why it says, I am the resurrection and the life. The life. What does the life mean? What does the life mean? I picked on my son Jersey in the first service because I remember, I don't know, some time back, he's always like one of the last ones to finish eating and we'd all pretty much done and someone says something like, Do you, are you going to have ice cream? And he was like, I'm all about that life. Anybody else like ice cream? You all about that life? You know, it's like somebody saying, you want some Starbucks? I'm all about that life. You know, you going to play some basketball? I'm all about that life. You going to watch the football game? Oh, I'm all about that life. You know, just, I, I'm into that. You, go, you going to church on Sunday? I'm all about that life, right? I'm all about, well, if Jesus Lord of your life, I'm all about that life. That's, I'm in. That's what I am, the resurrection and the life. Just, just get the paddles once, let them bring you up, and then be all about that life, and then you won't have to keep getting zapped over and over and over again. And that's what she does. She doesn't fade into the background like so many who get touched by Jesus. She becomes all about that life. She becomes transformed. She apparently, matter of fact, she, she forms a she squad. There's Joanna and Susanna and many others because apparently you don't get named unless your name rhymes. And so they start providing what looks like operational and ministries, support to Jesus. So she's got new meaning. She's all about that life. I don't have time to go all, in, go all into it, but it looks like she's wealthy. She's from a major rich city in trade. Her name has been drugged through the mud. She, her reputation has probably been destroyed, and now she's got a new lease on life, and now she's made Jesus... Lord of her life, she's going to be all about that life. She has suffered in mind and body. We don't know the whole story, but she has been infiltrated by demons. That kind of trauma, the gateway most of the time of the enemy is to exploit the weak and the hurting. And if she had the means, which she did, meaning money, she could have sought relief. She could have paid all kinds of different remedies and soothsayers to try to find relief. And they probably ended in nothings. Demons invaded her life anyway. In other words, every road she probably sought answers from ended in a dead end. And how many times do we try things that end in dead ends? 
And so when we find dead ends, then we start to doubt. There is no hope. Maybe even there is no God. And doubt then turns into major depression and discouragement. I'm in a pit. There literally is no data. I've made really major mistakes. There are consequences now. I have hurt myself and I have hurt people. And then it turns into denial. Now I am so wayward, so lost. Is there any right? Is there anything wrong? There's no right or wrong. It is what it is. That's possession. That's evil. Until one day, one day, a voice breaks the threshold of all that chaos. Mary, Mary, be free. And she's never, she's never forgotten that voice. And it sends all that darkness running. And why is it we try everything but Jesus why is it we, we'll try everything else first but Jesus? We'll try everything but an altar. We'll try everything but his word. We'll try everything we hear on YouTube. We'll try everything we, we see in a video. We'll try every dead end in this life. Before we try Jesus, before we try real hope, real freedom, and maybe you're sitting in a dead end this morning where you've got some doubt or discouragement, maybe just outright denial. Friends, Jesus delivers us from our dead ends. Yeah, but maybe I deserve it now. Maybe I've hurt myself and I've hurt others enough that I deserve where I'm at. I've brought it on to myself. Hey, guess what? We all do. We all deserve what we, what we get. We've all made mistakes. Jesus is in the business of bailing us out of our mistakes. He is in the business of turning dead ends and dead heads into, into U-turns, into turnarounds into new life. And Mary, she's experienced that. She's seen what God can do. She had life at her fingertips and she, she had wealth and a name. And she, she still lived in darkness until Jesus. And now she wants others to have that same kind of freedom. She wants others to hear that same voice in, in their life. Because there's not one thing happening in your life today that Jesus cannot deliver you. But I imagine that she would tell you that the worst day of her life isn't, isn't one of those days from her tortured, demonic past. I would imagine she would tell you it's the day they brutally and savagely murdered Jesus. That was her deliverer murdered right in front of her eyes. But she didn't flinch. While others were locked away in a room, she was right there at the foot of the cross. She, she never took her eyes off of them. I mean, think about this. She followed them. What, what manner of dedication is this? Transformation is this. See, you just, you know, sometimes when people don't understand why you praise the Lord the way you do, man, it don't, don't sweat them. Because, you know, they just probably don't understand what he's, what he's done for you, what he's brought you through. See, they don't, when they don't understand your testimony, they don't understand your praise. You can't, listen, you can't help it if, if, if they've just had a nice vanilla playing life. Jesus might have saved their soul, but he might not have had to rescue them like he's rescued you. So you just go ahead and praise him like you need to. Right. 
She follows him. She wants to know where that body's going. She sees him sealed up. She knows where they buried him. She watches. And I imagine that the, just the mentality and knowing that she's over logistics and support and given that the fact that she shows up with spices and new wrappings in a matter of hours, that she probably watched the way they prepared the body and she didn't like it. It wasn't up to her standards, so she decided she's going to come back and redo it. Because you don't embalm bodies twice. But she was. It wasn't good enough for her Jesus. That's how much she loved. She was coming back to, to rewrap and care for a dead man. So she and the she squad are heading to the tomb because that's what the director of logistics and operations does. She's going to do it right. And if you're wondering where her, where her loyalty lies, when the angel says, why are you crying? She still calls Jesus my Lord. Because just because he did doesn't mean he's any less Lord to her. And mistaking Jesus then for the gardener, she says, hey, if you got information, you tell me right now where the body is. Jesus is a grown man whose body has been prepared for burial. And she's like, you tell me where he is. I'll go pick him up myself. You getting what I'm saying? And once again, the words of John 10, 21 ring true. The sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. There was a point in her life where she had reached her last dead end and a voice pulled her out of it. She was dead in her sin. She was dead in her doubt. She was dead in discouragement. She was dead in denial. She was trapped in that darkness. She was trapped in that fear. And on the very first Easter, through all of her tears and chaos, once again, that voice broke through calls her by name Mary, and that's all she needed. That's all she needed. And the light switch came on. And on this Easter, I want you to know that Jesus has rolled that stone away, and through the chaos and the dead ends, he's calling your name. Don't think for one second, he's not. He's calling your name because the same voice that called Mary out is the same voice that continues to call out. In just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond in prayer to listen for the voice of Jesus in your life to two different ways. In one way, she had to listen to the voice of Jesus to surrender her life. That happened all the way in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, she heard the voice of Jesus call her name and she surrendered. Her life was resurrected and then she was all about that life. But here in John 20, Jesus called her name and then challenged her, gave her an assignment. Say, hey, this isn't a dead end. This ain't a dead end. I said, it is finished, not I am finished. Now, where are the boys at? Go get them out of their darkness. Go do for them what they once did for you. And so to every 
person in this room, I guarantee you Jesus is calling your name. He came up out of the grave, out of that dark place, so you do not have to live there, sit there, dwell there ever again in any place, in any space of your life. And I think sometimes we sit. We sit in our anxiety. We sit in those challenges. We, we sit in those dark places and we hear God calling our name. We might even sit in disobedience or maybe even our sin and we hear God call our name and like little JP sitting in the dark, we feel the tension. We, is this real? Is this real? Is that my dad's voice? Is this him? Because it's a scary thing to get up out of this bed in the dark. But if you would just get up and walk up out of that dark place, he'd meet you. Your sins can be forgiven. Not because you're good, because he's good. You can be set free. Not because you have the power, because you're strong, because he's strong. You, you, can, you can feel his presence in your life. Not because you deserve it, but because he loves you with an everlasting love. You can change. You can change. Things in your life can change. No matter what anyone sitting in your row may think. Because when he rose from the dead, he defeated all that darkness, dark thinking, dark thoughts. It's called the gospel. If someone comes to the piano, it's called the good news. God did something for us that we can't do for ourselves. The tomb is empty, and he, like, destroyed the door. Why sit in there? He's risen, and the resurrection changes everything. I am, he says, the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in me, will never die. Do you believe this? And I know a lot of people that believe he's the resurrection. But do you believe in this life? Do you believe? Yeah, I'm all about this life. Jesus says, whoever believes in me, you got to believe in both. Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Hey, we hope you enjoyed that message. If you liked it online, you'd probably like it better in person. We'd love to have you at Northside Assembly. You can find out more at mynorthside.church. We'd also love to connect with you, provide you with resources, and pray with you. So go to mynorthside.church, and let's get together soon.